Well, thank you so much, uh, fifth and sixth grade girls. That was a real joy. And now as we continue in our sermon series through the book of Romans, it's my great privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Peter Pendel. Uh, most of you uh, recognize um, that name because he pastored this church for about 30 years or so before he retired. And uh, I consider Peter to be a, a friend, a mentor, and if you look up the word pastor in the dictionary, you'll see a picture of Peter uh, right there because he is really a model shepherd uh, for the rest of us. And so we so appreciate his leadership, and from time to time he's willing to come back and be part of our sermon series, and, and so today is one of those days. Uh, he's also here with his wife, Ilona, uh, who also served faithfully here uh, for those 30 years as well in the music ministry and many other areas, and so we're delighted to have them both here uh, today with us. Uh, would you join, join me in welcoming from your couch there at home with a big round of applause our dear friends Peter and Alona Pendel. Thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Pastor Dave. It's a, a real privilege to be here today, to come back at a time when uh, we're so proud of what God is doing at uh, Millington Baptist Church. We invested our hearts here, our lives, and we've never left completely. So this is our home church. We're glad to be back. And Ilona's going to read the scripture for today. I'm reading from Romans 13, 8 through 14. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you should not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Thanks, dearie. Well, I said it's good to be back, and uh, I so appreciate what you are thinking about and what you're talking about, uh, and I'd like to pray for a moment before we turn to God's word. Let's pray, please. Father, our hearts are filled with joy as we think about your goodness and your grace, but our hearts are also touched with sadness by the uh, difficulties we see around us, we know that there are all kinds of people involved, all kinds of people who are hurting, Lord. We think of our people of color, our brothers, our sisters. We can't help but hurt with them, Lord. We can't enter into where they are, but we can at least listen and begin to understand a bit of the pain for so many. We thank you, Lord, for those who seek to enforce the law in a, a righteous way, not taking advantage of people, but, but being those leaders that we so much need to protect the rest of us, to protect all of us, Lord. And, and so we see this daily, this uh, battle going on where the enemy wants to destroy, you want to build up and you want to strengthen, Father. And that's our prayer for our country and ourselves, that we might listen to your Holy Spirit and walk with you, that uh, your word might find its place deep in our hearts and uh, find its place in our obedience as we walk with you. So even now, as we turn to your word, Lord, it is our desire to hear, to listen from you, not from a human, but from you. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you speak? Would you be with your people even now as we seek to hear you? For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, my parents told me about a, uh, I'm not sure the age of the kid, he was something three or four or five years old, maybe five years old, who uh, uh, lived in a uh, town in, in uh, New York State, Newburgh, New York, and who found his way undetected to the barn behind the, the house where they lived on a very busy road, Route 17, no, ex, uh, excuse me, uh, down right through north to south in, uh, in Newburgh, New York. Well, he was a curious kid, as you can imagine, so he began to look around, and it turns out he found some paint in the barn and thought it would be rather uh, neat to paint himself. Now, I, I don't mean a self-portrait. I've seen those. No, I mean paint himself. Well, thinking that he was uh, alone in the room, in the barn, which he was, he took off his clothing, or as much as he could manage as a young boy, and he, he, he 
applied as much of that oil-based paint, if you're old enough to remember that we had oil-based paint, uh, to his body. Wherever he could find a spot to put the paint, he put the paint. Thinking that he was taking a nap, his mom inside was content with his taking a nap until she looked out the front window, and there on Robinson Avenue, right in the middle of Newburgh, New York, the busiest street in town, there was her son riding a tricycle, most of his clothing missing, covered with this paint. Well, I don't remember that special day in my childhood. That has somehow escaped from my memory, but I've heard it from enough people to believe that it really happened. I, they told me likewise that I was told never to play with the paint in the barn and, and never to leave our property. It was apparently obvious to me at the time, as a critical thinker of four or five years old, that they were being overbearing and taking advantage of my freedom, and, and I really didn't need to live within those boundaries, those particular boundaries. Kind of like Adam and Eve. One tree. Just one tree. Out of all the other trees. Don't eat from that one tree, the fruit of that one tree. All the others are yours to enjoy. Not that one. An arbitrary decision lowered upon them by the tyrant of creation? No. No, you know that's not the case. Rather a boundary, rather guardrails that will allow them to thrive in the, in the place where God has placed them to establish a relationship that would grow and be vital with their father who had created them and placed them there. Not an arbitrary decision lowered by the tyrant of creator, but rather boundaries, rather uh, guardrails, the kind of thing they needed in order to thrive. That is one of, the, one of the ideas that pops from Romans chapter 13 in the passage that Ilona read. This idea of the law, how important it is for us and how much we need it. Now the Apostle Paul is still giving directions in terms of how to live out the ramifications of what he taught in chapters 1 through 12, and you've already seen that. Just before this passage, he has written about our obligation to those in authority over us, a passage which Pastor Bob did so well to set forth this past week. Uh, essentially, what he was saying is we are indebted to those who are in leadership over us. Uh, we have an obligation to them. And he said, Paul said, let no debt remain outstanding except, except to love one another. Except to love one another. That remains in force all of life. I mean, I can pay my taxes, and they're done for at least, at least a little while, not, not completely, but for a while. But another dose of love is always needed by every single person in my life. What Paul is doing here is he's taking the idea of Jesus, that we are to love one another, and putting it into terms that we desperately need to consider. He's saying, love one another, obey the law. And we scratch our heads and we say, the law? The law? What law? How do we love one another by obeying the law? How does that work? Somewhere a long time ago, I learned a way to think about the, the uh, laws of the Older Testament that was very helpful to me, and maybe it will be for you as well. Uh, one sense of the law in the Older Testament is the national law. And it's in the national law that God is talking about how Israel could thrive as a nation how they would set up villages, where to put the outhouse, uh, what food they would be well to eat, uh, how the government is supposed to work. Now, those laws, those laws don't have to be duplicated outside the nation of Israel in that time, although there are principles that have to be carried forward. So it doesn't release us completely, but for the most part, the national law is tied to Israel. The second kind of law that we find in the Older Testament is the ritual law. The ritual law would include the practices to be observed as Israel comes before God in worship. For instance, the priesthood of Aaron and his descendants, uh, the sacrifices to be brought before God in the temple, uh, the holy days, and more beyond that. Uh, again, there may be principles that are carried over, but for the most part, the rituals of the Older Testament are, are taken care of in Jesus. He has fulfilled them, and we no longer have an obligation to them. They are, in that sense, 
fulfilled, though there may be principles, again, that carry over. The final division of the law, as I've learned it, is the moral law. The moral law is what Paul is talking about here. Laws that transcend cultures and nations and generations, they're always true. That's the way we thrive if we stay within these laws. So in verse 9 of this passage, Paul gives an example, or several. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. Ah, some of us look at those and say, not guilty. Except that coveting may be a little bit of that, but for the most part, I haven't done those other things. So lest pride rises up in our hearts and we begin to feel good about ourselves, we're the good guys. He adds a few more down in verse 13 of our passage. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. He's talking about all of us, isn't he? Yeah, even if you just go to coveting and jealousy, we're all there. But this is the moral law. These are the boundaries. These are the guardrails established by God so that we and others might thrive. That's their intent. Now, I think that's a new way of seeing for many of us. We, we just haven't thought about the law in that. We've seen the law as restrictive, holding us back in one form or another. I think we need to rethink that and begin to see the law in this sense as freeing us. And it's always true. Back in the 60s, when I first decided to walk with Jesus and wanted to learn about how to live the life, I bumped into the teaching of Joseph Fletcher, who had a term called situational ethics, may have even had a book at the time. He was trying to put into writing what many people have believed back then and before then and even today is being enacted. He taught that there are times when the moral law is not the way to love people. There are times when lying is the loving choice, when stealing is the loving choice, when taking a human life is the loving choice. And you can see that being worked out in the day in which we live in so many ways, can't you? And admittedly, Fletcher had a way of putting together the scenarios in which it would be very difficult to know how to act, and it was very hard to think it through. But Paul would say, no, take the law, take the moral law, and see it in a different light. See it as the guardrails. See it, see it as the way we can go to, to, to thrive. This is the safety zone for us. Stay within these and love other people in the process. So it's not love or law. It's love and law. Think about that, what that means. So Paul would say, Look beyond the no and find the yes in the law that he gives to us. When God draws a line on the driveway, <laughs> you've done that, you, you know what that's like. When he draws a line on the driveway, it's, so, it's, it's, it's there so that we can more fully enjoy all that's left. The rest of the driveway we can play on. We can play in the house. We can play out on the grass. We've got so much he simply draws a line at the place where we would be injured if we went beyond it. And he says, enjoy the rest. I wish Adam and Eve had seen that. Oh my. They had everything else in paradise. God said to them, have a great time. Eat the fruit of all the trees. Enjoy it. Just not this one. Leave this one. This will not be good for you. It will harm you. So when you take it to the application of what we find in this scripture, if, for instance, I close the door on intimacy with other people beyond Elona, then I open the door to a great marriage. Oh, it doesn't happen automatically. I know that. You can still have a cold marriage. I, I get that. But I at least, I at least make it possible and, listen, I do the same for that other family who would be otherwise torn apart by my going over the line. That's how I love them. If I turn away from uh, carousing and drunkenness, I can then turn towards God and, and, and towards other people. Oh, it's not automatic, I know that, but, but, but I make it possible. And I do the same for my buddies who would otherwise follow me down the road that is not good for them. And so I love them as I give leadership in terms of that. 
if I refuse to steal, I will have to become productive using the talents that God has provided for me so that I can take care of my family and other people. And listen, I love my neighbor from whom I refuse to steal by giving him the chance to enjoy what he has earned. So I love him by refraining from stealing from him. I, I think this is incredibly important, and, and I hope you will consider this honestly in terms of your own thinking. And if you will take a moment to think about uh, this new way of seeing things that you may have thought of before. I'm not the originator of this, I'm sure. But, but think of it, especially as we think about passing our faith along to future generations, uh, generations that are so prone to reject the boundaries and say, no, that's not what I want. That's not what's best for me. Uh, for instance, every boundary that God has established for intimacy is up for grabs. You know that. People seem to say only the, see only the no. They don't see the yes in the boundaries that God has established. The simple picture of one man and woman, woman for life is seen as a cruel restriction on my freedom. We think God is so narrow-minded. No, he's not. He knows how to have us thrive. And so he gives us the boundaries. Help your kids see those boundaries as a gift. Help, help your friends see those boundaries as a as a gift. They are God's. Yes, I'm for you. I want you to thrive. So love one another. And hear this. Do it now. <laughs> you can't miss that in what Paul says. As we move through the text, we get to verse 11 of chapter 13 of Romans. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. We have no time to waste, my friends. Time is short for every single one of us. In fact, the next verse, verse 12, Paul says, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. He's talking about the day of awakening when Jesus will return. He's talking about the second advent of the Savior. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back at any time. We don't have the formula. We don't have it all put together. And I know, I know, there's lots of controversy among us about the details of that. But I'll tell you what, when you turn to the New Testament, there is common agreement among the writers of the New Testament that Jesus is coming back, and we will stand before him, and he will gather us to be with him. Hear Paul in another place. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. That's Paul. Here's James in chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Here's Peter, another New Testament author. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming and here's the Apostle John in Revelation, recording Jesus' revelation. He says in chapter 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And John responds, amen, come, Lord Jesus. They believed it. Time is short. He's coming back. But time is also short because I could go to be with him at any time. It's kind of funny. We know death is coming, but we're always surprised by it, or nearly always. Well, COVID-19 has surprised a lot of people. Some of those you know, some I know. But the truth is that we're all at risk, some of us more than others. <laughs> Early in the pandemic, Ilona and I were getting these phone calls and, and uh, tapes and or, uh, and uh, emails and texts, and people were saying, just call them to see if you're okay. <laughs> oh, my. One of the times we turned at each other and we looked at each other and we said, they think we're old, <laughs> don't they? They think we're at risk. <laughs> and we are. Oh, it was a funny moment. Please, I, call any time. <laughs> Email any time. Text any time. <laughs> it's fine. We were not insulted. But it was just one of those aha moments. Yeah, time is short for every one of us. I'm going to stand before the Savior who has paid the price for my eternity. 
and I'm going to answer for the way that I live my life. And I want to be ready, and I think you do as well. I don't want to apologize in that day to the one who gave everything for me. Time is short, friends. Time is short. We can't waste it. But it's not just about us. It's about others. I care about my loved ones and friends and neighbors who likely don't know him. Those others in my life, they need a faithful representation of Jesus. And they need to see that in the way that I treat them and others. I've seen enough failure. I've seen enough failure among my pastor friends. And I've seen not only what it does to them and to their family, but I've seen what it does to their community and to the larger reputation, reputation of Jesus in the world around them. I've seen that. So somewhere along the line, I got the idea of carrying a reminder. So I have a coin, and I give my coins to my pastor friends because I want them to remember too. And I have a, another friend who supplies me with the coins. It's just an Eisenhower dollar, and you can see it on the screen. It's a reminder that when I look at the face of the coin in Eisenhower's image there, I'm reminded that if I fall, my family falls with me. They go down the tubes with me. No way I can rescue them from that. I turn the coin over and I look at the back and I, I think to myself, if I fall, my church goes with me. I, I can't accept, escape that. They, they, they're going to be impacted by my failure. I can't let that happen. And then the final part of the coin is the outer rim. And as I look at the outer rim, it reminds me of the world around me. And it reminds me that if I fall, the world around me that is looking for a clear picture of Jesus in another person, they go with me. I don't stand alone. I, I'm not alone. I'm surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, both those who believe and those who don't believe. Why is there such a sense of urgency on Paul's part? Well, because we're in the final chapter. Jesus could return at any moment, and even if he doesn't, I could stand before him and answer for the way that I live my life and others depending on me to see what Jesus is like in the, in the highways of life. They're looking for someone who can tell us, yeah, it's true. So that's why it's important, that's why it's immediate, and that's why we need to do this now. We need to do this. Well, we're left with the question of how do we do this, and uh, Paul is good to tell us. <laughs> he doesn't end the passage before he comes to that place to tell us how to do it. I'll bet he tells us how to read the Bible more. No, not specifically. I'll bet he tells us how to give more money. No, that's not where he goes with this. I'll bet he tells us to have more, more discipline and more accountability partners that can hold us steady. No, no, that's not where he goes. Those are good. I'm, I'm not refuting any of those. I'm just saying they're not enough. They're necessary, but they're not enough because they don't get down to the inner man. They can all be done on the outside. What Paul tells us is something much more important out of which those will flow. He tells us, put on Christ. Put on Christ. That's the key. But what does that mean? Well, he tells us in verse 14, here's the NIV, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation, he, he writes it, instead clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is so graphic to me. What does it mean? To clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. To clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember that in Galatians chapter 3, Paul says we have clothed ourselves with Christ in conversion and in baptism. So when we first believed, we have clothed ourselves with Christ, and we think likewise that God has clothed us with the righteousness of Christ. Uh, that's true, but this is different. This is something else. We've already done that. The people who first received his letter had already done that. They, they are believers like we are, or most of us, or some of us. 
No, what Paul is talking about is the ongoing practice of putting on Jesus. It is like a robe, a cloak, so that we look like him, so that others see him in us. Now, if you'll take that idea and let that move around in your mind a little bit, as I've done in preparation for this morning and thinking about it prior to this time, think about the idea for a moment. What does it mean to clothe yourself? What are the ideas that come out of that? It surely sounds to me like it's intentional and conscious. It's something I do intentionally. This, this doesn't happen automatically. I am clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and God does that. But this seems to say that I have to do something. This is beyond my initial trust in Christ. It also tells me that it must be repeated. One and done doesn't get it done. So what I need is I need somehow to clothe myself with the presence of Christ throughout the day, many times in the day, depending, I suppose, on what challenges are coming my way. But I need to do this over and over and over again. Likewise, it has to be more than a ceremony. This is not something I go to church and somebody does for me. No, this is not a ceremony. It may not even be done the same way every time that we do it. It, it is, this is, let me, let me put it in terms that may be more familiar to you. This is my pursuit of God. This is, this is my seeking after him. That's what this is. It's my pursuit of him, not of things about him, not of things that he will do for me, but of him, of him. And I guess the final thing I would say as an implication of it is I need to stick with it. No matter how he responds, earlier in the service we've, we, we, we sang The Waymaker, one of my favorite songs, and, and even when he's not, he's not doing it, he's working. <laughs> even when he doesn't seem he's working, he's working. That's what he's doing, so, so I need to stick with it. Remember, this is like putting on a garment. This is like putting on a, a cloak. Okay, okay, so we've, we've got these ideas. It has to be intentional and conscious. It, it, it needs to be repeated throughout the day. It needs to be more than a ceremony, and, and I have to stick with it. Let's get practical. How do I do this? I have learned lots of things over the years, and this is one of the most precious learnings that I have to report to you because I think it's so essential. As much as is possible, I need a time and a place. That's what I need for this putting on the presence of Jesus, a place that is a sanctuary for me, a time that is sacred to me. For me, most mornings, that's down in the basement by the furnace. I get up in the morning, I am aware that he's... He's waiting for me. God is waiting for me down in the basement. Can you imagine? If that's not enough to get me out of bed, then I don't know what is enough to get me out of bed. He's waiting for me by the furnace. God, who created everything, he cares enough to wait for me. That's my sanctuary. That's my sacred time. Am I there every morning? No, there are times when I can't be there. I get that. But he's waiting there for me to put on Jesus. That's why he waits for me, that I might set my course for the day. He's waiting for me. It is a tender thought. It is a precious thought that God is waiting for me in the sanctuary at a special time, a sacred time. Grab that. Don't let go of that. I, I find, though, that I need reminders throughout the day. And you can bet over these years, it's over 50 years that I've been a Christian and over these years, I've been trying to remember throughout the day, and I've tried a lot of things. Most recently, I, I went to the App Store, and I downloaded One Minute Pause from John Eldridge. And you can go to your App Store, your Google Play Store, and you can get that. It's, it's just a way uh, on your phone of going through the day and having periodic times through the day when you will pause for one minute. And there's some nice music on it. And you'll just calm your thoughts and turn them toward Jesus. It is the opportune time to put on Jesus that put on the presence of Christ. I, I, early in my, uh, the renewal of my life, uh, about oh, 20 years ago, I read uh, Schizero's book, Emotionally 
healthy spirituality. And he talked about the rhythms of the daily office and Sabbath. And that, that, that was helpful for me for a time. Right now, what's most helpful for me is worship music. I, I don't know why that's the case, but, but I, am, I am aware that as I, as I listen to songs like Waymaker, but others, many, many others, and as I take time throughout the day, when I have time, it's just a reminder. I want to consciously uh, uh, tie into what's being said in the worship music and sing it along with the singers and, 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 and just take that time to put on Christ. I am, I'm more than ever aware that I need to see the, the different events in my life during the day and, and look for the fingerprints of God. I, I need to look at the creation around me and, and look for the fingerprints of God. I, I need to see the people in my life as brought into my life and, and bearing the fingerprints of God so that, so that I am brought back to this place where Jesus is what matters and I put on Christ again. And, and I may not say those words, I may not do those words, but it brings me right back to what, what really matters in life. And I, I need that on a regular basis. I need it repeatedly throughout the day. So that's my, that's my practice right now. It's worship music and it's, it's, it's intentionally looking for the fingerprints of God in the midst of my life, whatever that may mean at the time. And then Paul is conscious of something else, and so he adds one more idea in this passage. In verse 14, he says, I need to guard my mind. I, I, I've got to get a hold of my mind. Verse 14, he says, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Do not, do not leave room in my mind to gratify, to think about it, to ponder how I can do the wrong thing. Don't allow for that. So, so as I clothe myself with the presence of, of Jesus, I, I remove from my mind whatever would lead me in the wrong direction, whether it's online or it's in print or it's conversations or it's, it's people. I, I had to put a guard around my mind so that the stuff that wants to come in that would harm me and my, my pursuit of God is not allowed to come in. I, I want to tell you something uh, of which I'm more and more convinced every moment of every day. And that is that Satan is, is scared to death that I will get so filled up with Jesus because there's no telling what a man or woman who is filled up with Jesus might do in the midst of life to change things. And I, I mean all things. Social issues that we're dealing with private sins that we struggle with, going across the boundaries that, that we shouldn't go across, hurting other people in the process. Satan is terrified that I, that you, will get so filled up with Jesus that we'll spill all over the place with the sweetness of Christ. If I'm going to be that man, I need... Uh, at least from my experience, I need a time and a place every day or as many days of the week as I possibly can. I, I need reminders throughout the day because I forget it goes its way and I get busy with other things and I forget about him and clothing myself with Christ. And I need to guard my mind. And you do too. We all say that we want the fullness of Christ, or at least the people that I'm closest to. We want the fullness of Christ. I do. I, I don't doubt that you do. The question is, am I willing to pay the price for the fullness of Christ? Don't get me wrong. God has to do the work. I understand that. But I think I'm fair in saying that eternal life, I can do nothing to get that. But fullness of Christ, I can do all things to get that. That's my choice. Am I willing to pay the price for the fullness of Christ? It's not found just in going to more Bible studies. So it's not found just in going to more prayer times. It's, it's not found in just giving more generously. It's found in seeking Christ in the midst of all those things and other things in pursuing the one who pursues us. It, it's found as you clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm called to do. I learned a prayer recently. It's not very profound, I guess, but boy, it's meaningful. I learned it from somebody else. I heard it in a podcast with John Eldridge, and, and it's a prayer that really has to flow from my heart, 
and it has to flow from my heart, whether I'm at work or I'm, I'm riding along the road or I'm, I'm with my friends or I'm with my family, wherever, wherever I am, it has to be a part of who I am. He, here it is, you're gonna find it amazingly simple but terribly profound. I need more of you, Jesus. That's what I need. I don't need what you can give me as much as I need more of you, Jesus. I, I don't need the benefits of knowing you as much as I need more of you, Jesus. And, and I'm finding myself as I, I'm in my quiet time or I'm riding along the road, I, I'm, I'm just repeating this prayer from my heart and I'm saying, Jesus, I, I need more of you. And if I have more of you, I will be clothed with you, with your presence, and I'll be ready to love people around me regardless of the cost of loving them around me. So, so are you willing to say to God, I need more of you, Jesus. And if you're willing to say that, then wherever you are, why don't you stand with me? Because I'm standing. And why don't you hold out your hands? Because I'm holding out my hands. And, and why don't you, in your own way, say, I need more of you, Jesus. I need more of you, Lord. Father God, you know that we need more of you. We need more of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we say Jesus because we can see him in the flesh. So, Jesus, we need more of you. Would you break down the barriers that keep us from that? And would you give us such a craving, such a hunger, such a desire that we're willing to pay the price to have more of you? Clothe us with your presence. For this day, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.